Hello, good morning, and all. We'll wait uh, for another two minutes and then we'll start off the class. Yeah, shall we start our class? Yeah. So, dear students, uh, now we are into the block five, which is the last block, and uh, today's class is also the last class. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this block is basically dealing with the journalism practice. As we have learned earlier, the different blocks what we had, if you just, uh, yeah, let us also recap, because uh, there are students who have also joined for, uh, for, for today. So in the block one, we have read about um, communication, where we discussed about the concepts and nature of communication. Then <clears throat> also we have discussed about the need of communication and barriers of communication. So as a YASM1 topic is about the basics of communication in journalism. So as part of that, the block one dealt with the communication. Then block two, we talked about the communication and its role in the society, where we have talked about different kinds of the media, yeah, somebody is, uh, uh, you know, yeah, if and some one on a kindly mute your mics, ma. Yeah, somebody's mic is on, ma. Please uh, kindly mute. So, where we talked about <clears throat> in block two, where we talked about communication in society and different types of uh, types of media, uh, and also talked about the <clears throat> you know the communication skills required, and what is the role of communication in the society. Block three content about the mass communication, yeah, and he talked about its nature concept. Uh, its characteristics and also discussed about the trends in the mass communication. <clears throat> when now blo block four, what uh, we have dealt last week, it was talking about the journalism, where we have discussed about the concept and nature of journalism, principles of journalism. 
further to that extension, today we are discussing about the block five, which is called as journalism practice. So more or less, uh, <clears throat> what we discussed last in, in the last session uh, can also be discussed here because it is uh, talking about the journalism as such as a practice. So. <clears throat> So in this block, basically, we will try to understand what exactly you mean by the term fourth estate and also describing the journalist and the news outlets who work for the, <clears throat> yeah, who work as part of the fourth estate or the media organization. Basically, there are two units where for unit 11 is explaining about the concept of fourth estate. More so specific, uh, you know, specifically talking about democracy, freedom of press and pressures and advocacy role of media. Then unit two, it is uh, dealt with the types of journalism. Yeah, what are the different types of journalism? So to begin with, let us understand the press as fourth estate. So students who are online, can you just tell me, uh, uh, did you ever come across uh, the term called as fourth estate? Yeah. Anybody? What do you mean by fourth estate? Anyhow, the objectives of this lesson would be Understanding the concept of a fourth estate in reference to democracy, describing the role of a press as a watchdog, and understanding the freedom of press and pressure, and the function of agenda setting by newspaper will be discussed. And never to forget that journalism also plays an important role that is called as advocacy role. So we'll also discuss about the advocacy role of media. <clears throat> if you go back, let us understand that uh, what is fourth estate? So when we are saying fourth estate, definitely there are other three estates or three pillars. In a simple manner, when we are saying fourth estate, it is something, the fourth pillar. So we understand that you know democracy has four pillars. So what are those? Legislature, judiciary, and executive. And these are the three estates. And the fourth one is the press. So the fourth branch of any government for the functioning of the democracy, it, it is very important that the press be <clears throat> the, uh, is always there to understand the functioning and also to explain the functioning of the democracy in the society. Going back to fourth estate, this term is attributed to Edmund Burke, which was coined in 1729 to 1917. Uh, this Edmund Burke was, uh, you know, British politician between 1729 to 97, who coined this word called as the fourth estate. He referred to the House of Commons of Great Britain. Yeah. And we see that Thomas Carle quoted the phrase in his book called as Heroes and Hero Worship in History. So Burke said that there are three estates in parliament and reporters gallery is also there. So therefore he termed it as a fourth estate. So basically the fourth estate is a societal and political force or institution that influences and is been officially recognized. Why it is important? Because access to information is essential for a healthy democracy, basically for two reasons. The first being to ensure that citizens make responsible, informed choice rather than acting of ignorance or misinformation. Then second information serves as a checking function. <clears throat> so the first one is about uh, where the fourth estates, uh, the fourth estate 
works essentially as a responsible and informed source for the society so that the society be ignorant or be misinformed and the second one is the checking information where it talks about the representatives uh, issues and uh, how they are doing and talking about their performances so here we also see that you know the influence of mass media affects uh, not only the political course but the society so when we are originally referring to the fourth estate we are basically um, referring to the print media <clears throat> because during that uh, 18th century that is between 1790 uh, to 27 and all those things we didn't have electronic media so when we are referring to print media uh, for the state it is basically the print media so here the for the state has primarily three roles first one is to remain independent of government control then scrutinize government activities then provide an arena for people to enter into the public debate so what are the three functions of uh, fourth estate to remain independent of government control to <clears throat> scrutinize government activities and provide an arena for the people to enter into the public debate so what exactly you understand by remaining independent it means that media ensures political news is not censored or limited by personal bias yeah so when we are saying independent it is something <clears throat> independent of reporting political information but not censoring or being biased then scrutiny of <clears throat> you know government activities is something where we are trying to inform about the political actions holding decision makers to, to be accountable for their work or the performances then we the, the third function is about the people to enter into the public debate so if you have any issues or something so in general well if people are well informed then they will be able to respond to the political actions so <clears throat> when they are not comfortable or when it is not going by the society then those responses can be taken into consideration and this can media for the student can play an uh, platform where uh, the society uh, the citizens of the country can boycott the lawful demonstration can have a talk back in the radio or write letters to the editor have a public submission send a pub opinion polls etc so thus we see that you know fourth estate has a definite role to play in this society <clears throat> as we said this concept of fourth estate is basically dating back uh, to this uh, works where we have talked uh, he was uh, referring to the parliament where the other three hands of parliament were uh, there so the fourth press was is also very important so if you see in the united states the media is often called the fourth branch of government or the fourth estate because it monitor it monitors the political process to ensuring the political players don't abuse the democratic process so <clears throat> other calls the media as a fourth branch of government as it plays an important role in the making of the political candidates and issues now we also see that there is a controversy related to it because news reporting is supposed to be objective but uh, with the trends uh, with the kind of competition <clears throat> with the hegemony of the media owners and all those things uh, there are per, uh, preconceived ideas so that uh, brings a controversy we also have to understand that the fourth estate has in a democracy has a role of a watchdog so what is a watchdog yeah, yeah watchdog of a 
representative democracy it is referred directly to the print media where it has to come to present all forms of new media and it should maintain an ideal balance between reporting parliamentary activity and also the public opinion and also remain independent we see that you know liberal theorists have argued that the existence of an independent press with each nation is very essential when uh, to the special reference of democracy so by it as it contributes towards the right of freedom of expression thought and conscience strengthening it also strengthens the responsive and accountability of governments to all citizens and provides a pluralistic platform and a channel of a political expression for diverse people we see that you know the guarantee of freedom of expression and uh, information eh, which is a basic human rights uh, in the universal declaration of human rights uh, which was adopted in 1948 yeah so as part of that everybody has a freedom of uh, speech and expression so let us understand what is the universal declaration of human rights so part of article 19 of 1948 the the universal declaration of human rights states that everyone has the right of uh, right to freedom of opinion and expression which includes freedom to hold their opinions without interference and to seek receive and impart information through any media regardless of the backgrounds okay so this is how we see that we have got the right to freedom of opinion and expression yeah we have to see that you know the positive relationship between the growth of the free press and the democracy is to be maintained the core claim should be that in the first stage that is the basic basically the initial transition from autocracy state control of the media to private ownership diffuses access and reduces official censorship and government control of the information uh yeah. only i think please kindly enta tappisado na jaise dispute is out lakhna yeah candidates please mute your mics hmm almost na tappisado bro so if you see in the late 50s and 60s that is in the early modernization uh, era we have assumed a fairly simple and unproblematic relationship between the spread of access to modern forms of mass communication economic development and process of democratization the diffusion of mass communication represented one sequential step in the development process so a free press can strengthen the public sphere by mediating between citizens and the state facilitating the debate yeah <clears throat> so what is the watchdog role so the watchdog role reflects to the long established liberal conception of the news media as part of the fourth estate basically the journalistic paradigm is the belief that journalists carry out an investigative and watchdog role on behalf of the public where we can where we have to see that you know the reporting done by the press should be objective and should be based on the fact and have a critical reporting style so the watchdog function of journalism is at the heart of several organizations today so the watchdog has shaped the normative expectations and we have the media at the level of media structures where we have professional values and relationship between media and the state government and in terms of the conduct 
the manner of operation and performance that is in terms of news content we have to balance the relationship between the state and the press we see that you know the watchdog plays an important implication for the relationship between the media and the state yeah while referring to the authoritarian theories uh, journalism uh, should always be subordinate to the interest of the state in maintaining social order <clears throat> if we just go back when we have learned about the journalism we have learned about the normative theories also where it talks about the author authoritarian theory where it says that you know the press cannot be above the state so the press has to maintain certain <clears throat> limitations also in the interest of the country's security so what stock principle is being threatened in the contemporary journalism by overuse and by a fake watchdog tendency uh, this is what basically we see that you know why the media is being criticized the watchdog has been threatened by a new kind of a corporate conglomeration so why because of the media hegemony we see that you know there is a threat and uh, this has been um, you know uh, yeah we, we we see that you know the media is not uh, having uh, is not able to adhere to its professional codes ethics and values and objectivity of the reporting we have to understand that you know the purpose of the watchdog also extends beyond simply ensuring that the people are in power and transparent but it is the duty of the press to recognize where powerful institutions are working effectively as well as uh, whether they are uh, uh you know the uh, performing their roles perfectly or not so now let us understand the freedom of the press and the pressure as we understand you know universal uh, universal declaration of human rights that we have article 19 so as part of that we see in our indian constitution that article 191a gives the freedom of expression that means freedom to express not only one's own view but also the views of others by means in, of including the press but then there is also a clause of 2 under article 19 where it says that you know the <clears throat> freedom of expression is not an absolute freedom but it has subject to the limitation contained in the clause yeah so where in we see that you know state can impose reasonable restrictions on the freedom so we have article 19 1a which guarantees uh, you know um, uh, freedom of expression but uh, under article 192 we have a reasonable restriction also here the, we have to understand that the press as such has no privilege when compared to in, uh, when we are talking about india but however the freedom of press is same in uh, to any ordinary citizen article under article 191a freedom of press in india do not guaranteed by constitution or any specific laws drawn it's an inspiration from universal declaration of human rights then when we are talking about the freedom of press it means to the freedom from control uh, of the government that is what we have um, discussed earlier that you, you know we have to have a independent uh, press we have it is not worthy to uh, our fact that you know journalist committee is more concerned about the freedom of press than the media houses there are certainly instances where the press has crossed the line and forgotten self regulation on such occasion some argue in favor of uh, some kind of restriction on the press when we refer to justice mark and de kaju the um, who was the you know chairman somewhere in 2014 of the press council of india he argued that some, that there should be some kind of control on the press monopoly press has become an impediment for the free press so two fundamental rights are involved in the right to freedom of speech and expression one is the right to receive news and views and the second is the right to communicate news information and views speech is an innate to, to all the human beings as we understand because communication is a fundamental process in our social life so as part of the fundamental rights anybody has a, any citizen in the country law abiding citizen in the country has the right to freedom of free speech and expression and the right to receive the news and the views then what do you mean with democratic societies 
democratic society in, um, in general can be defined as the free diverse and the pluralistic uh, media that enables public debates and serves as, as an essential check on the power so in many societies across the world it is precisely the powerful impact of the independent uh, journalism and increasingly the digital media and the coercive effects that creates an anxiety to those in the power so journalists and media still face restriction coming from the government interferences however in um, many countries there are fundamental threats to journalism uh, to the journalists and to the media we see that you know laws statutory regulations intimidation tax fine fines um, highly concentrated ownership etc uh, is what they will be uh, face uh, these are the flags faced from the government by the journalist then we have developing countries so what is the role of uh, what do you mean by developing countries and what is the role of uh, for uh, media in the developing countries so in developing countries that is the ref when referring to the third world nations newspapers plays a play a very important role in disseminating a balanced picture of national affairs as it has to contribute to, to the growth of literacy and development of the nation repression in the independent opinion is common in several countries though but freedom of press is by no means universal even in developed countries we see that you know there are great uh, leaders all over the world who were in favor of freedom of press but they have a certain inconsistencies that um, they were not able to form their own opinion or their opinion was uh, understood or was been considered for example if you go refer to the thomas jefferson somewhere in april 13 1743 uh, who was a politician between 1743 to 1826 and uh, who is known as an american founding father and the third president of united states uh, he said that you know the basics of government being the opinion of the people the it the very first object should be to keep that right then he felt that you know the, that uh, it was left to decide whether we should have a government with newspaper or without the newspaper so he was of an opinion during his regime that you know when we are talking about um, democratic country or the developing country or developed country a special reference to the democracy he had an opinion that you know the government should have the decision of whether it should go with the media or not however yet as a president jefferson became disenchanted with the press yeah that means he was not that much uh, interested in the press but um, as we understand it is called as a fourth uh, estate so it has to go with the governance then we see that you know when when we are coming back to our indian uh, reference uh, with reference to nehru he has also stated that you know the press if it wants the freedom which is ought to have, have must have some balance of mind which is uh, to be a seldom in possession possession so one cannot have it both ways so every freedom in the world is limited limited not so much by laws or by the circumstances so he states that he, he doesn't want to wish to come in the way of the freedom of the press but personally he felt that you know the freedom of the press is what there should be existing but at the same time it has to be you know have certain limitations and in 1950 in one Uh, in a speech in parliament uh, he again has uh, stated that the press is one of the vital organs of the modern life um, when we are uh, quoting democracy so the press has a tremendous powers and responsibilities and the press must be respected and must have all cooperation and on another occasion also in uh, speaking to the newspapers uh, editors conference uh, you opine that uh, the freedom of press is just not a slogan but uh, a larger point of view but it is an essential attribute of a democratic process so what we see is that you know even the politicians also uh, uh, go by that you know they in a democratic country we need to have a, a freedom of press so 
The first amendment of the Constitution of India enacted in 1951 made several changes to the fundamental rights provisions of the Constitution. It provided against the abuse of freedom of speech and expression. Uh, it was moved, uh, this amendment was moved by uh, the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, and enacted uh, by Parliament in 1951. Two cases such as, if you see, one related to the left-leaning journals crosswords, another related to an organ to organizer journal led to the first amendment of Indian Constitution. Unlike the first amendment in the US, did not that did not promote freedom of expression but curtailed it, prioritizing the promotion of the national security sovereignty over the promotion of democratic institution. So the amendment of the first amendment in the constant context of US constitution refers to the right of freedom of speech and expression, a right that has been held to almost absolute in the US. The first amendment when referred to the India is something that was constituted in 1951, which attempted to strengthen state regulation over the freedom of speech and expression by expanding the scope of Article 192. That is the, about the reasonable restriction. Yeah. So let us uh, discuss a bit about our situation in India. Yeah. As we understand, you know, that a free press in India remains among the uh, we still have uh, some importance about the uh, free press uh, in India. So, when we see this one, there we, we see that, you know, India, while reporting on, in the international political matters and all those things, India fell into the difficult, uh, there is a ranking actually, you know, the Paris-based reporters um, without borders ranked India 138 out of 180 in 2018 index. So the, uh, the rank what we had as a freedom of press was something related to 138, which is a very bad representation of how the press works in our country. Yeah. Then the other role is about the agenda setting, functions of the newspapers. So we have to understand that why we talk so much about the press, because uh, apart from giving the information, apart from talking about the issues um, newspaper also works uh, and plays an important role like an agenda setting which is the most important media theories of the present time so if you see that where you know the journalists basically they deal with the several news that are very important uh, into day-to-day -day life then they access uh, all this uh, Reports and uh, we see that you know the news editor will be <coughs> publishing the news. So here, when we are publishing, some stories are published in a greater length and prominently displayed. Others receive only brief attention. So here, the media is taking an um, advantage of putting according to their editorial policy what the, uh, they feel that you know that is of most priority and trying to set an agenda. Yeah. Newspapers, radios, and televisions uh, we are also an extent and form of the fourth estate. But we see that, you know, media could be used to maintain autocracies, uh, unfortunately, and reinforce capitalism and consolidate the power of media oligopolies. Now, this is uh, during the era of this modernization that is from 1950s uh, after the Second World War, that uh, how it has uh, been only a representation of the elite class. So, when we are talking about the agenda setting, it is a process whereas the mass media determines what we think and worry about. You know, what we think is not, but it agenda setting is something where it talks about what you should think about the issues that are happening in the society. So Walter Lippmann, a journalist, absorbed this function in 1920s. So according to him, he pointed out that media dominates over the creation of pictures in our head. He believed that the public reacts so not to actual events, but to the pictures that are being presented by the media and that are being captivated in our minds. Therefore, the agenda setting process is used to remodel all the events occurring in our environment into a simpler model before we deal with it. The impact of mass media, the ability to effect cognitive change among individuals, 
to structure their thinking has been labeled as the agenda setting function of a mass communication. So we see that, you know, here lies the most important effect of mass communication because it has an ability to mentally order and organize our world for us. In a short, we can say that, you know, mass media may not be successful in telling what to think, but uh, stunningly successful to tell what to think about. So that is all about the agenda setting. <clears throat> then role or advocacy role. So advocacy role is the act of pleading or arguing in favor of something such as a cause, idea or policy or by giving an active support. So advocacy journalism is a genre of a journalism that intentionally and transparently adopts a non-objective viewpoint, usually for some social or political purpose. As it is intended to be factual, it is distinguished from propaganda and it also has a distinction that, you know, uh, the media can be biased or fails to report objectively. Yeah. So advocacy journalism is a fact based and supports a specific point of view on an issue. So advocacy journalism does not set out to inform, they rather set out to advance an agenda, whether it is a conservative or liberal. So advocacy journalism assigns a journalist the role of active interpreters and participants who speak on behalf of certain groups, yeah, like representing about the LGBT cases or about, uh, uh, you know, underprivileged uh, societies uh, talking about the women issues, all those things. So it is uh, trying to advocate about the issues of social issues that are happening. So typically, it is the role of uh, interpreters and participants who speak on behalf of certain groups, typically those groups who are denied powerful spokesperson in the media. So journalists are representatives for specific interests and are motivated by the desire to redress power imbalances in the society. So we understand that, you know, as a journalist, we are the voice for the voiceless, voiceless and we should be working in such a way that, you know, we motivate and redress the uh, issues uh, that have imbalances uh, and are being uh, misrepresented in the society. So <clears throat> they are guided by a reformist impulse to promote perspective, uh, typically under or misrepresentation of in the media. Here we to understand advocacy journalism is uh, opposite to the gatekeeping model. So what is gatekeeping? When, as we said, you know that uh, reporters will file all the news, but uh, you know the editor will uh, uh, decide according to the editor policy, editorial policy or uh, um, the other conditions and uh, censors the news, censoring of the news or, you know, uh, filtering of the news is called as a gatekeeping. So it is exactly advocacy uh, journalism is exactly opposite. That means, uh, you know, this advocacy of journalism is guided by the ideals of objectivity and public service. It refers to organized groups that use the media to influence reporting and ultimately affect public policies. Yeah, for example, uh, you know the peer group, the, the uh, uh, group search NGOs, and all those things that work for the climate change, uh, uh, for uh, environment protection, child protection, women protection. All those who are part of the advocacy of journalism. It belongs to forms of political mobilization that uh, tries to seek the increase of the power of uh, people and groups and to make institutions more responsive to the human needs uh, and attempts to enlarge the range of choices that people have increasing <clears throat> have by increasing the power to define problems and solutions and participate in a broader social and policy arena. So through advocacy journalism, civic organization aim to raise awareness, generate public debate, influence public opinion and also uh, make a key decisions and promote policy and uh, changes around the specific issues. So it is all about the advocacy journalism. So this is all about the principles of journalism. Now let us talk about the practice of journalism. So in this part, we have, we'll be discussing about the print journalism, broadcast journalism, investigative Ma journalism. Yeah, ma'am. Ma what, what is the page number, ma'am? Page number 125. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
so uh, development journalism photo journalism and uh, these are the various forms of uh, journalism so when we are saying journalism uh, we either confine to a political journalism or to the glamour journalism or to the business but apart from that one as we have understood that you know media also has <clears throat> a watchdog and advocacy role of journalism so a part of it one we also understand you know there are new various forms of journalism that can help in a democratic setup so in america the president resign reigns for four years and journalism governs forever and ever is what a statement it's an adage given by oscar wilde so journalism as we understand uh, this is all repetitive that you know what is the journalism and all those things so now we have to understand that you know when we are talking about the journalism it is basically the print media that we talk about so what are the uh, you know what do you mean by print media print media is one of the different forms of mass media and it is basically including newspapers weeklies magazines monthlies and other forms of printed journals so when we are saying print journalism it is not only the newspapers but apart from that we have weeklies we have magazines uh, we have brochures we, anything that is printed form is a uh, related to the print journalism so this uh, print journalism uh, if we go date back uh, we see that you know that um, before this uh, 14th uh, century uh, there were chinese uh, print uh, that had a block printing and all those things but later on we see that you know it is the uh, Gutenberg who has got the printing into uh, uh, actual use and after that we see that you know that uh, the printing has uh, taken a re revolutionary form and uh, uh, slowly we see that you know there were so many papers coming into the existence. So talking a bit of the print journalism in India we understand that you know it came to India in 1556. Uh, it was the Jesuit priest who brought this technology and the first book printed in India was the Portu in the Portuguese language in Old Goa. Uh, what is the first book? It is the Bible that was been printed. So, German, German language, I think. No, ma'am. When we talk about uh, that one, actually with the printing technology, that is with the old form of uh, printing thing. But uh, generally, if you... A search also the first book that has been printed is uh, basically because it was into number of copies so it okay. was uh, johannes gutenberg that uh, who bought uh, uh, who, who printed the first book and that was the bible in 180 and the number of copies were somewhere uh, between 100 to or 180 copies so basically when we are saying print it is not one or two uh, that way, if you go back, uh, you know, in the ancient stories, everybody had their own literature. But uh, having literature is different. Printing of num technology. We are talking about the printing technology. So, when we are talking about the print journalism in India, it is uh, the Jesuits of uh, Jesuits, priests at Goa who have brought this printing technology to India. So the first book printed in India was in Portuguese language in old Goa and the India's first newspaper was published from Calcutta and if you remember uh, uh, he, uh, he is the Britisher and he's called as the James Augustus Hickey who launched the first newspaper and that was called as Bengal Gazette or uh, the other title was also called as the Calcutta, um, Calcutta Advertiser and but basically uh, it was popularly known as the Hickey's Gazette. So the first newspaper that existed in India is what? It is the Bengal Gazette. And uh, who bought that newspaper and uh, who published the newspaper was James Augustus Hickey in 1780. Basically, the first issue of the paper had two pages and later on it increased to the four pages. However, when we talk about the Bengal Gazette, it had a very short uh, period, uh, somewhere around one or two years, because uh, it was only talk, the uh, Bengal Gazette was uh, concentrating on the public affair, on the private affairs of the British rulers, um, British um, uh, uh, East India Company uh, people talking about the criticism, criticizing, criticizing about the British authorities at the personal level. So somehow what happened was that, you know, 
he published reports attacking the east india company officials he rather talked about the private deeds of the officials of the east india company so british authorities uh, you know then have arrested and stopped and confiscated the paper in 1782 and stopped its publication and he was asked to leave the country and he was sent to england copies of bengal gazette are still kept in the national library in kolkata and british museum in london but it is all the more interesting to note that the second third and fourth newspaper in the country were also launched from kolkata only so following the hickey's uh, footstep in 17 1780 the second newspaper that was launched was indian gazette and the the calcutta gazette which has started publication in 1784 and the bengal journal were other newspapers that we see uh, that came after the hickey's gazette then slowly we see that you know there was a uh, uh, increase into the um, and the spreading of the newspapers and that's that is how we see that there is madras courier madras gazette uh, and all the other newspapers were introduced launched and also we see that there was a mumbai herald from mumbai so the press regulation and censorship imposed by the british stood in a way to starting so later on when we see this one you know uh, the british understood uh, and realized that you know with the help of the press there is some kind of uh, anti incumbent uh, happening so they also started putting uh, press regulations and a part of that one we have the vernacular press or the gagging act that stopped the indian languages so when when we are talking about this uh, english languages these are the newspapers that existed but also we see that rajaram mohan roy who is also known as the father of indian language journalism have fought for the freedom of the press and published magazines in english hindi persian and bengali and spread modern knowledge and polit- and politically educated the readers he published the brahmanical magazine in english in 1821 and another notable magazine was the sambad kamudi Uh, which was published in 1821 and uh, ram mohan raja ram mohan roy also p- published meerut lagbar in persian language the first language paper uh, in india was started in kannada language the kannada samachar but the publishers of uh, this uh, newspaper were uh, the foreign missionaries so we contribute the first um, language paper to um, to raja ram mohan roy only so so <clears throat> the first paper that means was launched was by an indian was from calcutta so the bengali gazette by gangadhar bhattacharjee in 1860 was the first indian language newspaper that we see in 1816 the gujarati daily mumbai samachar published from mumbai is the oldest existing to till date also we still see mumbai samachar also so if we date back uh, to print journalism in telugu uh, the early uh, the earliest telugu journals uh, like in other several languages were promoted by missionaries and mostly intended for religious propaganda the first journal uh, monthly it was uh, called as satya dhuta that was published from bellary in 1835 it was printed in madras which is now chennai and concentrated on propagating the gospel of christ ritta man what is ritam tini is considered as a first telugu journal because satyadyut was meant for religious propaganda and several such journals were also published subsequently the hitavadi was published weekly and later on it was ceased and the canadian baptist mission published a weekly called as revi from kakinada giving space to news as well as the religious matter however we see that you know viveka vardhani of rao bahadur and k videshan lingam pantulu who was also a scholar educationist and social reformer made a serious beginning in telugu journalism so when we are talking about the telugu journalism we owe to go back to you know videshan lingam pantulu he devoted to the social and language reform and um, he also started this andhra sabha sanjeevini edited by kokanda venkat uh, ratnam pantulu who was also a scholar and socio religious leader these two papers carried on a uh, lively controversy on the common subjects uh, in the society the first news weekly was called as andhra prakashika which was published in 1886 by ap partha sarthi naidu from madras it supported the national congress and it continued for 25 years then we have sasileka which was the first weekly to campaign for the unification of telugu speaking areas and the formation of separate province of andhra pradesh yeah then the 
we see also that you know there was a, a telugu daily newspaper uh, that goes back to the devgupta shesha charyar who started the desha abhimani which was basically a fortnight newspaper so this uh, uh, at about this a uh, time there was a controversy between the champions of the literary telugu and simple popular telugu so andhra sahitya parishad patrika published by parishad in 1911 took the cause of simple telugu so that was a literary language that was been used and uh, we see that you know the simple language was also used so after the andhra pradesh first successful successful daily newspaper andhra patrika was started from, as a weekly from bombay in 1908 a by kasinath nageshwar rao pantulu he was basically a businessman and a patriotic instinct led him to uh, take up the journalism he moved the weekly to metras in 1914 and converted it into a daily then the daily and the weekly as well as the monthly bharati uh, was started in late 20s and it patronized uh, it was patronized by the telugu reading public andhra patrika and andhra prabha were the most uh, newspapers that were been published and uh, were into the competition also then we see that um, uh the andhra prabha gave a tough competition to andhra patrika which was published by express group in 1938 and the first editor was kasav subarao and narayana murthy followed him as a editor and narla venkateshwar rao was the first famous editor of andhra prabha who set a high benchmark for telugu journalism he was an versatile and well read person and uh, he uh, uh, he was also playing a vital role in shaping the public opinion on several pressing national and regional issues and coined scientific telugu terminology and uh, we see that he has resigned uh, from andhra prabha and became the editor of andhra jyoti uh, that started in 1916 vijayawada we also see there is a krishna patrika that started in that started in 1902 by konda venkatappaya and dasu narayan rao and later edited by m krishna prasad then we have prajamitra anandavani janavani prajabandhu and swatantra ta were also edited by legendary kasa subarao the formation of andhra pradesh state uh, in 1953 also gave an flip to the telugu journalism then we also see there is a a uh, modern uh, impact of modern technology so the other uh, form of uh, journalism is the broadcast journalism that is related to television and radio journalism yeah so when we are talking about radio we are referring to all india radio and doordarshan yeah then there is a, a separate style of writing for uh, the radio and television because radio is having an oral music and sound as a medium television is a visual medium with the audio effects then we have a cyber journalism with the growth of the technological advancements uh, with the growth of the technology cyber journalism which is popularly known as online journalism is what uh, in today's date we see that there is a um, immense um, potential for the, the cyber journalism because uh, with the help of the technology we are able to connect very fast and uh, the world has turned to into a global village according to the mac lohan what we have studied this investigative journalism is also another form of an journalism which is the primary duty of a, a journalist so it is though we report about the daily happenings but uh, investigative journalism is something where we have to give, we give an ob- objective fact based information which uh, works for in any democratic setup so we have seen uh, it talks about uh, you know more uh, uh about the political corruptions and the corporate on doings the hidden uh what is that uh, is the present adani thing going on so all all those uh, are part of the investigative journalism so when we are talking about the um, investigative journalism basically it is a research based it should have an analysis of documents then it should have um, also t- take into consideration the social and the legal issues uh, and rti act to get the documents from the uh, government agencies so there are many scandals like bofor scandals that were been part of the investigative journalism this development journalism is very important as we talk about the nation building yeah 
So development journalism is of a uh, very important because uh, we need a development at the grassroots level. So uh, it has a different types. A new school of journalism it talks uh, focuses on, on the conditions in the developing nations, and uh, we need to have an improvement at those levels. So. Uh, it is something where we will talk about how the process uh, and the, how the governance, uh, what is the kind of, um, you know, standard of living happening at the grassroots level can needs to be reported. So it is something where it is talking about the infrastructure, it is talking about the health, it is talking about the social sector, it is talking about the economic development. Then photojournalism, as you say, one picture has a worth of a thousand words. So photojournalism, as you understand photography and all those things, it also has a very huge and wide um, career. Then uh, <clears throat> global journalism. So in, uh, we are now in the era of the globalization. So definitely globalization, uh, as we understand, is part of the trade, finance, uh, and about the market where the world is turning into a single market. So as part of that one also, we see that, you know, uh, we have uh, many economic policies and all those things. So the global journalism is also very important to understand how the economy is important and uh, how the business are being done. What is the transaction? What are the rules? What are the policies? Is, uh, and whether it is working in the favor of the, our own country or not. So these are the different kinds of the journalism we see apart from the political reporting. So these uh, all this journalism, when we are trying to focus, they are all basically trying to build the society, especially in reference to the democratic setup. So with us, we come to the end of uh, the, uh, this uh, session of uh, SEM1. Uh, in case if you have any doubts or if anything, please let me know or uh, you can just message me. Fine. Any doubts or anything? Or shall I end the class? Yeah. So all the best. Eh? Prepare well uh, for your exams. Eh? Or if any doubts or anything, please uh, Contact me. Thank you.